Good morning. And welcome. Lovely to see you all here. And I trust we'll be blessed today as we meet around the word of the Lord in his house. Use the words of At the Name of Jesus as our opening song, and we stand to sing. Now let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, as we come to you this morning, we're glad that we can come in and through the name of Jesus. We're glad that for so many in this building, 
We have already bowed the knee, gladly bowed the knee, and trusted your Son and our Saviour as our only hope of being right with you, our only hope of having our sin removed, our only hope of having a righteousness that we could never attain. And it's all because Jesus came. And therefore, his name is precious to us. His name is something that stirs our heart. And we're glad of the day that we learned of the name of Jesus. May this ever be a house, a place of worship where the name of Jesus is not just spoken, but is honored, and that Jesus is given the preeminence. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. And as we come in his name, we also come with believing faith. Lord, we trust you. And we know that even as we have called out to you in the past and we have prayed and we have leaned on you, you have not let us down. You've been there when we needed you. You have worked wonderfully in our lives. And even since we last gathered here and since prayer was last offered in this place, we have reasons to thank you. We want to thank you this morning for answer to prayer that has spanned seven years for Dr. Ken Elliott and the fact that he's released all those years, his family and, and supporters didn't know what had happened to him. And there were many times we wondered, and Lord, how delighted we were to hear of his release. Thank you for answering prayer. Bless him, bless his family, bless his time of recuperation. Strengthen him, we pray. And may he be able to even tell of the goodness of God in the darkest of times. Lord, dark times come to us all. It isn't perhaps always as dramatic as, as being taken captive or hostage. But Lord, dark times come to us all. And again, we thank you that you come to us, standing somewhere in the shadows, we will find Jesus. Lord, we give you praise for those times when you've drawn very near, and we've known it, and we praise you and thank you for your presence with us. Lord, there are those in the fellowship, and they're going through difficult times, and you know each situation. We pray that you'll help them. We pray again for our brother Richard this morning and for him, for Diane, for his family. Lord, may they know the nearness of the Lord. And may Richard experience the touch of the healing power of God. And we trust, O oh Lord, that we will believe on and see him raised to health and strength again. We think of Anne's brother-in-law. We've been praying for Alan. And Lord, we know that you have been at work, but we pray on. Uh, he really needs a miracle. And we ask that you will touch him also. Father, we think of Sam's brother, Ricky, and we pray for him too. Being brought to our attention, we leave him before you and ask not only that you would touch him, but speak to him. Lord, there are so many who we know of who are going through difficulties. They have ill health. and Some are advanced in years, like our dear sister Claire and Ali Kernahan. We pray for both of them. But yet we know that they're safe in the arms of Jesus. We know that they're yours. There are others, Lord, and we fear for them. And our prayers go up to you on their behalf. Lord, our, our list grows of those who need you. We pray too for Tommy and Lil that you'll come very especially to them. Lord, as we think of the needs in this fellowship, we realize that there's not one of them that you cannot meet, and we leave them with you. Father, we think of the children and young people you've blessed us with. We're glad that next Lord's Day, in your will, we will be able to see them taking part and encourage them in that way. But Lord, we just pray for them and for those who raise them, the homes they come from. And you know every situation that our young people come, to, come from when they come to this place. And we just ask that early in life they will come to realize that you are interested in them. You have a plan for their life. And we pray that all the attempts of the enemy will be thwarted as he seeks to undermine their belief in you. And we ask that you will protect them by your power. Lord, we 
do think ahead of those who are leaving us over the summer. We will miss them, but we realize that they'll be going to get experience in the service of God in other places. They'll be in teams, they'll be at camps, they'll be helping with Spark locally. And we ask that they will grow in their faith. We ask that they will be a blessing to those that are on the team with them. We ask that they will not just be good ambassadors for Monkstown Baptist Church, but that they will be wonderful ambassadors for Jesus and that they will be enthused by what they experience in serving you. Lord, we pray for next Lord's Day morning. We think of some who may come who wouldn't normally be here. And if there are those who come in without Jesus, we pray that they'll come with prepared hearts and that your spirit will follow them and bring them to know you. Lord, we thank you for your word. May the message this morning, simple as it is, familiar as it will be to so many, yet, Lord, may that message come with freshness by the working of your spirit. And may it be a word for some heart, we pray. And as we remember Jesus later on this evening, we pray that there too, there would be a sense that the Lord is with us and that he's pleased with us as we take the bread and take the cup and once again think of him. For those who have the rule over us, we commit them to you. We know, O oh God, that uh, there are things that happen and the changes that come in governance, but we know, O oh God, that you are the one whose prophetic calendar is still on course and you, O oh Father, are still able to work everything so that what you have said will come to pass and we will only have to stand back in amazement. But in the meantime, we commit those who have the rule over us to you and our prayers always is that we might see evidence of your power at work in high places. Answer our prayer if you see it from our hearts as being offered with faith and belief, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, boys and girls, we haven't run out of brothers and sisters, but we're not doing brothers and sisters in the Bible this morning. And I was waiting for some of you right enough to come up and give me some suggestions, but that didn't happen. So uh, I got off track. And this morning I want you to look at a picture that might come up on the screen. What's that? Yes, Alice. It's a frog. But I want you to take a closer look at that frog. And then we're going to look at another picture. What's that? Yes, Joe. An aeroplane. Very good. And I want you to take a close look at that picture as well. There's some folk now grinning at me from ear to ear. They've spotted what they have in common. Here's another one. What would that be? Somebody is having this for lunch this afternoon. Is that right, Lucy? Lobster. Now, are you starting to see that they've all got something in common? Oh, dear, help us. Even the older people. Oh, Alice has got it. They're all made of feet. Did you spot that? Yeah. Aye, you're not that slow. Well, you're saying yeah now that you've told you. <laughs> they all started off as a paint print from a foot, although the lobster, there's hands as well. Who's ever done that? I know some of you have stood in paint by mistake. Some of you did it when we were renovating the church. You stood in paint when you shouldn't have. But who has done a footprint? Lara says she has, and Joel has, and Per Louise has, and Anne Cole is admitting to it as well. But I wonder, did you make your footprint into a picture? Did you? Well, here's a challenge for you. If you have a go at that in the next week or two, I'll not be up here next Sunday morning, you'll be glad. But whenever I am back, we'll show some of your pictures, will we? <laughs> and certainly they'll go up on Facebook. 
And uh, uh, there's no age limit to this, by the way. <laughs> we'll see all your bunions and all your corns and everything else, hard skin. <laughs> they all started off with a foot, and there's a wee demonstration of how you do it. You stick your foot into the paint, or you roll or some paint on the back of your foot, press it good and hard on a page, and you get a print. Although it can go wrong. You can get a wee bit carried away, and the paint can go everywhere. So now that we're in the better weather, it might be a good idea to do it out in the garage or in the, in the garden. Yes. Well, in the Bible, there are lots of verses that mention our feet. And some of them just talk about our feet the way we talk about our feet. For example, in the Bible, somebody might say, he stood on his feet. So that's fine. We don't have to understand anything more than that. It's just talking about your feet. But then when we read a verse like this from Proverbs 4 and 26, there's a wee bit more to it. Because there we read, give careful thought to the paths of your feet. And that's using the idea of your feet to help us to think about how we live our life. And the different steps we take on the journey of life. Have you ever thought about giving careful thought to where you go and what you do when you get there? Give careful thought to whether or not you're actually getting to know God better. Whether or not you're maybe walking a wee bit closer to Jesus than you did a few weeks ago or months ago or maybe even years ago depending on how long it is since you became a Christian. Or maybe you're not yet a Christian. Maybe you're not yet saved. You haven't yet trusted Jesus as your Savior. And that's still a good verse for you to think about. Because the direction you're going, if you don't belong to him, is not towards him. Every step you take is another step away from him. And that's why in the Bible, the word repentance means to turn completely around. And then you start to Go on a journey, step by step, every day, in the direction of God, with Jesus by your side, and with the leading of the Spirit. And there's another verse that helps us on our journey. <coughs> psalm 119 and verse 105, it's a big long psalm. Your word, speaking of God's word, is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Now, we don't go around as Christians with this great bright shine and light on our feet just because we believe that verse. But the Bible helps us to see things that might make us trip and fall. Things that might get us into trouble. Things that might get us away from God. The Bible is like a light in that way because it helps us to see things that perhaps we wouldn't have seen if we hadn't got God's word, the Bible. And that's what it means by the word being a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. I like what Job says in Job 23, verse 11. My feet have closely followed his steps. Wouldn't that be a great way for us to leave this world and go to be with Jesus? With people being able to say, do you know that was true about him? That was true about her? And for us to be able to say it ourselves, my feet closely followed the steps of Jesus. And of course, Jesus didn't do anything that was wrong or anything that would get us into trouble or make us ashamed. I wonder, are we following Jesus? That's one of the most often used Names for people who belong to Jesus in the New Testament. Followers. His followers. Jesus said, follow me. I wonder how closely you're following Jesus today. And here's a big long verse. And it says, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. And that's where Paul is making us realize that we are all important in church. We're all important amongst other Christians as a group. And some maybe are the people that you might think 
are like the head in the church. They are the ones that you always see at the front. And then some people are the ones you don't see so much. Just like in your body, the first thing our mind, our, our eyes go to is someone's face because we recognize them. But we don't often look at their feet. Sometimes we don't even look at their hands. But every part is important. And as you come to know and love, love the Lord and walk with him and live for him, you can have an important role to play, even in church life. Do you know, there's people in this church today, and they went to Sunday school. They were carried in here as babies. Is that right, Judas? So they've been here at the stage that you're at now, and they're still here. They're part of the body, and everybody's important. And that's a wonderful thing to realize. Well, I hope as we think about things like this, we pictures that it helps us to understand more about God, about God's Word, the Bible, and about ourselves. Thank you for listening so well. We're going to sing again. This time it's Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And we will stand to sing. And after that, the, or during that time, the young people who go to Children's Church can leave. <laughs> Well, we're still between series, uh, with Children's Day being next week. I uh, didn't want to start something today, so we're going to continue looking at Psalms. This is what we have been doing between series. We've been looking at the book of Psalms. So today we're at Psalm 103, and I was surprised myself when I looked and checked to see if I'd spoken on that psalm here, and... As far as I can tell, I haven't, and uh, I was amazed at that. That's probably one of the most loved psalms in the book. Uh, but anyhow, I felt led to speak on that today, and would have done so even if I'd spoken on it before. And it's Psalm 103, a psalm of David, and we read as follows. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. 
As for man, his days are as grass, as far of the field, so he flourisheth. The wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. Do such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. What a wonderful psalm it is. I remember having to memorize that for Sunday school. It took quite a while, but... Uh, it was worth memorizing, and I'm sure many of you were the same, and these words are in our hearts today. Bless the Lord, O my soul, is the theme. Not hard to work that out. In fact, this is a psalm that almost preaches itself, and I'm sure as you read through that, things came to your mind uh, as you thought about what we were reading together. But in saying that, and David saying that, bless the Lord, O my soul, He's calling upon his own heart and mind to acknowledge and be grateful for the Lord's measure, immeasurable and inexhaustible provision, not only for his spirit, for him spiritually, but also for ev in every way, body, soul, and mind. And because of the magnitude of his, this provision of the Lord, David repeats this over and over. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 22. Bless the Lord, O my soul. But in one verse, he adds a wee bit. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. See, the psalm begins and ends with David calling upon his own heart and mind and spirit to bless the Lord. And he says, all that is within me. But then at the end, he also calls upon the created world to join him in blessing the Lord. And it doesn't stop there because he calls upon a world that we can't see and that David couldn't see, a world of angels and heavenly hosts, that they would join him as well. It reminds me of what someone once said about this psalm, and there's ripples of praise. We have the area around, we have what's beyond, but what we need to be concerned about is what's within. It should begin there, all that is within me. We're not responsible for the, the way creation displays God's glory or the way the heavenly hosts adore and praise him, but we are responsible for what's within here, within you and me. But something else is that we never then praise alone. Maybe there are times when you felt that you were praising the Lord alone. Maybe whenever you came to the Lord with a particular request, you couldn't share that with anyone else. And therefore, when the answer came, you praised alone. But you weren't praising alone. All creation is praising him, and the hosts of heaven are praising him. And even when one sinner repents, there's joy in the presence of the angels. We never praise alone. Some folk uh, disagree on what is meant throughout the word of God by the hosts, because they do have different meanings. Sometimes it can be an army that's mentioned. It can be spirits, angels, good or bad. It could sometimes even mean the physical created stars. But one thing we know for sure is this, that Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, is the Lord of all hosts. And surely all hosts must acknowledge that he is the eternal God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So then we get to verse 19. We read this here. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord all his works. There was an incident in the life of Jesus, and it's recorded in Luke 19 and 40, 
Uh, he was coming into Jerusalem, making his entry into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And people began to cry out, Blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees immediately got annoyed about this and said to Jesus, This is uh, nothing short of blasphemy. Tell them to stop. And I love Jesus' reply because he says, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the very stones or rocks would immediately cry out. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And the Psalm 8, Psalmist says, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, what is man that thou art mindful of him? So of course, the created world, the world around us, blesses the Lord, even points us to the Lord. But they are doing that continually. The problem is with us that we're not continually glorifying and blessing the Lord. Even those of us who have known the touch of the Lord, the grace of God, his love, his mercy in our lives, we can so easily withhold praise from him. And, and things, big things perhaps, but even little things can cause us to rob God of his praise and our gratitude to him. Because it's towards us favorably as his children every minute of every day. David, because of this, he determined within himself to bless the Lord. If we fail to bless the Lord, perhaps it's because we've forgotten what he's done for us. Isn't that why it's important to come to the house of God and to come regularly? Isn't that why it's important to come to the Lord's table and to come often? Because we can so quickly forget all that the Lord has done for us. And I think that's why then David mentions what he does from verse 2 onwards, the end of verse 2 there. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Benefits. And what are they? Well, simply put, the benefits that David's thinking of, well, they're really the things that the Lord does for David's benefit. Not just in the past, but in the present, because it's in present tense here. Who forgives, who pardons, who heals, who redeems. doesn't say he forgave, he pardoned. He forgives, present tense. He redeems, he satisfies, he performs all of these things continually for his people. This is ongoing. Whether we realize it or not, whether we're open to see it or not, or whether the troubles of life have, have obscured this from our view or not, the fact is he is continually working for our benefit. You know, we can sometimes mechanically thank the Lord for saving us. It's better than not thanking him at all, but there are times when it can be a bit mechanical, part of a discipline in our life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. And we just think about the past tense, that time when we came to know and love and trust the Lord, that moment of our conversion in the past. But his love is shed abroad and shed upon us continually. <laughs> We are always in his love and care. And he's bestowing things for our benefit upon us day by day. We benefit from the Lord's great provision all the time. We could say that he is our heavenly benefactor. We are the beneficiaries. But unlike the idea of a benefit system, you have to get that out of your mind because Let's face it, most of us contributed toward the benefit system uh, before we availed of any of it. 
in many cases. That's not so when it comes to the things that God does for us for our benefit. He is indeed the great benefactor. He is the one who has bestowed this on us, and we are those who have been blessed. Surely, that's a reason to praise him. And the benefits David has in mind are God's tailor-made benefits for him and for all who trust him. Oh, we are indebted to the Lord for such rich provisions. We've nothing to pay. We just have to simply accept and trust him. And he will meet our needs. Having then accepted his bountiful provision in its many facets, we should be careful to acknowledge this and to be grateful for this. We should bless the Lord. And that's why David has to stir himself up. That's why he has to call upon his own spirit. That's why he has to say to what's within him, he says, bless the Lord. And here's why. Charles Gabriel wrote a little hymn And it contains these words. For all the Lord has done for me, I never will cease to praise him. And for his grace so rich and free, I never will cease to praise him. But I like how it begins. For all the Lord has done for me. He's probably read Psalm 103. Because there David's saying, forget not all his benefits. There are two ways in which David uses the word all in this psalm. Firstly, as we've mentioned, all that the Lord has done and will do and continue to do. But secondly, the word all mentions all that's against us, all our iniquities, all our diseases. And from this psalm, we can form two lists of things that appear to fall into one category or the other. All that's against us and all his benefits. When we look at the things that are against us, or at least the things that David lists here, because there are many more we could say, they're destroying things. Disease. Guilt stemming from our iniquities consequences stemming from our disobedience, death, the pit, the grave, fatigue. All of these are very negative things. They're very destructive things. They're not edifying things. But David uses these, I believe, as a contrast so that we can then marvel in the all of the benefits that the Lord has provided for us. Healing, forgiveness, redemption, satisfaction, power, new life. What a list. What benefits, what provision that God has made for us. Jesus said of himself, the Son of Man has not come to destroy lives, but to save them. There are enough destroying things that are against us, enough negative things. But he has come to do something for us. And let's not forget that. Let's not forget that. In Psalm 116, the psalmist there asks a very good question. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Spurgeon is quoted to have said, we often write our blessings in the sand, but we engrave our complaints in marble. Not true. All the benefits that have been provided for us. Sin brought the offense But the Lord brings forgiveness. That's in the passage. Sin brought disease and death. But the Lord brings healing. Sin brought ruin. But the Lord brings restoration. 
Sin brought degradation, but the Lord crowns with loving kindness and tender mercies. Sin brought discontentment and guilt, but the Lord brings satisfaction. Sin brought weakness, but the Lord provides power. Let's never forget that. And let's bless him for all these benefits. The end of verse 5, we read, So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Well, if we're here in the Lord's will next Lord's Day morning, we'll be looking at all these young people with all their energy and not a wrinkle in sight. And we'll be thinking about how youth and beauty passed away, as the hymn writer put it. And uh, yeah, we would all like to have our youth renewed, I'm sure. And if this was a promise from God that we could, by trusting him, put the brakes on the aging process, well, there'd be a lot more folk coming to church, wouldn't there? It would be one of the most lucrative businesses on the planet. But it is just an illustration. And what it's really saying is this. There have been some claims made about different things that happen to eagles, but when you actually scrape under the surface and look at the behavior of eagles from those who know, you'll find that they don't mention any of these stories. So be careful what illustrations you read. But here's the crux of it. The idea is that although the eagle is mighty and majestic and strong, it still has to keep on feeding. It still has to be satisfied. Still needs nourishment and rest. It's amazing that I think it's over 30 times that eagles are mentioned in the word of God by way of illustration. But the idea here in verse 5 is that by benefiting from all that the Lord has done for us and partaking of all that he has provided for for us, we can be, through this, we can be consistently strong like the eagle. And that ties in with what we read in Isaiah 40. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. So let's not forget this. That's a wonderful provision. And I believe that in the next verses after this, David has a a time in mind, a period, an era in mind, when God's people often forgot his goodness and provision for them. They often fail to bless him for his benefits. Verse 6, The Lord executeth or worketh righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. You mightn't see much in that. It might seem like though sometimes we, as we go through Psalms in particular, we pick out the juicy bits and then the others, we just treat them as though they're fillers. But it's important what's said in those couple of wee verses. Because I believe David is referring to a period of time. People who were oppressed, he's mentioning that alongside the leadership of Moses and powerful acts of God on behalf of the children of Israel. And when you take it apart like that, you realize that David surely must have been speaking of the Exodus. The redemption of Israel from the house of bondage. And not only in getting them out, but the humiliation of Pharaoh and all the Egyptian gods as God did that. But then down the line, there, was also time, there were also times when there had to be chastisement in Israel. They disobeyed, they rebelled. They didn't appreciate his provision for them. And they didn't keep his covenant as they promised. I've said before, and uh, I'm convinced of this, that's why I repeat it, that the Bible is a book of journeys. Journeys of individuals, yes, we've looked at some of those and we've learned from, from those. Journeys of families. And journeys of nations. We have the children of Israel then, of course, They became a kingdom, then the kingdom became divided and went off in different directions. So there were journeys of of the people of God. And we learn about God's interaction with his people and with mankind through these scriptural accounts of these journeys. 
And in the accounts of these journeys, we also discover that God has done much for the benefit of his people. God has done much on the journey of life. God was always there reaching out to his people. And when they turned to him, they found that he was willing to come back again. Generously, lovingly, and restore them and take them on with him. What an amazing God we have. But we also see man's reactions to these provisions and these benefits. Think of the Exodus story and, and then think about what Moses said in Deuteronomy 8. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein fiery serpents, scorpions and drought were there where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of a rock who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not beware lest thou say in thy heart my power and the might of my hand has got me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And there are many examples, of course, of the children of Israel forgetting. But here's one, and it's a king. 2 Chronicles 32, and it's King Hezekiah. But King Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up. Don't forget. And yet it's in these stories, these journeys, whilst we do see the failure, we also see some amazing facts about who God is and about God how God relates to his people. We read on Psalm 103 from verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. What a fact. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. What a fact. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. What a fact. As heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them. As far as east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What a fact. And we can see there that David's even struggling to describe the, the height and the, and the breadth of the mercy and grace of God. Is there somebody here today and you're backslidden? Maybe you're backslidden in heart, but you haven't done anything openly that would cause us to raise an eyebrow, but you know in your heart you're as cool and you're far away and you can't say today that you're bubbling over with the joy of your salvation. Read these verses again, verse 8 to 12, and remember this, they're facts. And God wants you to know this. Come back today. Maybe you've been feeling the chastening hand of God upon your life. Again, read these verses. Let them really penetrate your heart and mind and spirit. He will not always change. Although we read of God being slow to anger, that's no reason for us to be slow to get back. And having presented himself and us with these incredible facts, David goes on to explain why the Lord would deal with us in such a merciful and gracious way. And here we have it from verse 13. 
Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. So we forget that he is amazing and he is the eternal God, the one who rules over all. His dominion is everywhere. We forget that, but he doesn't forget that we are very, very different to that. He remembers that we are dust. I'm glad of that. He understands us. He knows us. And how does, is that? Because he made us. We looked at one of the compound names of Jehovah in the past. Yahweh Hosea the Lord, your maker. And that's why he knows us. Because he made us. In Jeremiah, we read that we are like clay in his hand. And sometimes we feel the pressure of the potter, but he'll never overwork the clay. And that's why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 10, God is faithful. And we could stop there and just say amen to that. But he goes on. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tried or tested above what you're able, but will with the trial also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. He knows us. He knows we're dust. He knows that the treasure we have is in earthen vessels. And he comes and treats us like a father. But unlike earthly fathers, they may be kind, they may be generous in spirit, they may be forgiving and all of those things. But they're limited. And in the next verses we see that David puts another contrast before us. The limits of man and the limitlessness, if that's a word of God. For as for man, his days are as grass as the flower of the field, so he flourisheth, verse 15. For the wind passeth over it and it is gone, the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, to those that remember his commandments, to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. We are so fragile, we are so changeable, we're so weak, we mess up, we get it wrong, we fail over and over and over again. We are limited, but we can't say that of God. God is eternal and so are his attributes. Moses in Deuteronomy 33 says, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are everlasting arms. We just bounce sometimes to the, the refuge bit and the everlasting arms. But it's the eternal God, the one who cannot be limited, the one who is almighty, the one who inhabits eternity, the one who made the crashing oceans and the still pond is the one who comes to us and surrounds us with those everlasting arms. Is it any wonder the psalm ends the way it does? Bless the Lord. He has angels that excel in strength that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works and all places of his dominion. And then it comes right down to the responsibility that he begins with at the start. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. He's worthy of praise this morning, isn't he? Well, a few of you think so. He's worthy of praise this morning, isn't he? Oh, let's bless him. And find time even today and come out tonight and bless him around the table for that most amazing provision for our never-dying soul. We're going to sing, My Hope Was Built on Nothing Less, as our closing song will stand as we do so.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, and forget not all his benefits. Father, we can hardly take it in, what you've done for us, and what you're doing for us, and what you will do for us. And even in this song, it takes us right through to when we'll stand before you one day. Oh, what a provision. Father, forgive us for not blessing you, for not praising you, for not acknowledging and being grateful for all your benefits. As we separate the one from the other, may we know your continued hand upon us for good, for Jesus' sake.